24th, Trips and Traps, Andy Serling, joined by Richard Migliori. Well, we got a short but select uh, collection of races, but I think one in particular that I'm really excited to talk about because it's something we talk about a great deal, sprinters stretching out and what you expect from them, how they should be ridden and how they should run. I agree, and I think that's one of the themes of this show is talking about different rides and what you do in circumstance. And the first race we're going to talk about was the Correction, which is the third race from Saturday the 19th. And the heavy favorite, Paula Silver Lining. Now, perhaps she was a little over bet at 2-5 to five and was facing a very legitimate adver adversary, and she's the one, Paula Silver Lining, in the eventual winter clothes fall off. But this was a situation where Jose Ortiz was on Paula Silver Lining, and unlike her last race where she drew outside of the speed, Mama Mia, Mia, Maria, this time she drew inside of her, and I think he did not keep his position going forward. No, and especially when she broke as cleanly as she did. Now, now to be fair, she bobbled a bit, but she was going forward, and she was actually in front about five steps you know, after the start. And you got to know, as soon as you pick up the overnight and the races are drawn, well, I've got post one. I'm coming off a huge effort. I'm going to be a big favorite. I am the hunted one. I have an X on my back. So in a perfect world, I'd love to lay second or third. I don't have that luxury. I've got to seize the race from the start and not be victimized. And he didn't do any of that. I agree. It put Manny Franco, who was riding very, very well, who was on the second choice, close ball off, the eventual winner. He was able to ride not only his horse, but ride Jose's horse as well. And you saw him look over around the 516th pole, knew he had Jose, and knew he had him. Oh, absolutely. And, and he would, all the way down the backside, he knows where the favorite is. He's got him in the pocket. And like you said, he's looking over coming to the quarter pole just to make sure that he's not going to get through, that he's got him. And then, listen, he's on a nice filly as well. Close right. fall off is not a bad filly. She had turn of foot. When you get that first run and you put that separation, Paula Silver Lining would have had to have been secretariat to catch her. She would have had to have been much the best in this race. Now, I think it's fair to say, I think if you asked Jose, he would say, well, I got in the clear by the eighth pole, and I only had a length nap or so to catch her. My filly wasn't good enough. Maybe he's right if he had said it. Now, I'm just presuming he would say something sure. like that, and I can understand that argument. Do you think that's the case? Because maybe there's an argument to be made the winner was the best horse anyway. Well, very, very possibly, but we'll never know that the way this race planned out. I mean, he, he had perfect position every way with the other, the favorites compromised, Paula Silver Lining. Now, that's very well possible, and, and I do respect Cole's fall off, so I'm not denigrating uh, her I, or her effort. But they went the last eighth in 12 seconds flat. How fast do you expect your horse, no matter how good they are, to be able to go the last furlong? 11 and 2 to, to beat her? How about 23 and 3 for the last quarter mile here? And she's not only now gotten two lengths in front of you, but she's got that momentum going forward, and Jose's horse hasn't gotten herself out the clear. So when she got out in the clear, she had to do that in that 11 and 3, third, you know, fifth eighth of a mile. Yeah. And I think that's what made it hard for her to finish off as well. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, we're getting to the time of year where the turf's going to start pretty soon. You see horses with that kind of trip be able to finish on the turf. You don't see horses accelerate that big on the dirt. And so, you know, when people say, well, in the turf, they're in there and they're tight and they steady and then, yeah, they can go an eighth and 11 then. They don't do that on the dirt. It'll be interesting to see if both these fillies come back for our distaff at, on the main track because I'd love to see these two start a rivalry because I think they're both improving talented fillies and they're horses that really could be players in the division because that's a wide open division, the older fillies and mares sprinting. Oh, it is a, a budding rivalry and we like that. No, I agree. It'll be interesting to see on a fairer playing field how they match up the next time out. The next race, the fourth race from Saturday, we're going to look at a horse on the far outside the JY who's off a layoff. And the seven Benevolence, a first-time starter, and the eight Noon Monsoon. Now, Richie's very interested in Noon Monsoon, who certainly didn't get a great break. No, he kind of hopped and just, just broke kind of like a first-time starter. Hopped, ducked in, uh, bounced into Benevolence there, one of the other horses we're going to talk about. And it took him a little while to figure out, oh, wait, I'm in a race. And to me, the second or from the 16th after the, the break, what he does going to the turn tells me this horse can run because you can see he's last and out of position at this point. But when he gets in the bridle, he kind of runs off a bit with Mike Leslie and runs off into trouble. Yeah, this is a horse, you know, I, I have very mixed feelings about this race. One of my problems with the race is I don't know how good it was. And that's something you always have to keep in mind, and you want to handicap these horses as they go forward. The first two finishers, though, dominated in the front end. They were two favorites, so they were able to control the race, and I think that worked even more against your horse, Noon Monsoon, 
as well as the JY, who was wide the whole way. I thought of the three, Benevolence, who finishes third, and there's Benevolence, there's the JY. Noon Monsoon's getting into it here, and I know you want to talk about him quite a bit, and I'll let you in a second. I thought Benevolence had the easiest trip of the three. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, you could see how much wider uh, the JY is on the outside there, and, and they didn't go very quickly up front, and they did run one, two around the racetrack, and these were two horses that had a lot of experience. They've been racing, so they've got more foundation. Um, but you can even still see here, the noon monsoon is still in the bridle, still in trouble, and what I like about it going forward is, is that this horse got about three races of experience in his first start. How concerned are you? Because Mike does a good job of new months of getting through. But meanwhile, that six is going to drift a little bit and caught behind horses. Are you at all concerned that Noonan Monsoon didn't ultimately end up finishing that well, or do you think he had just had enough off of the other trouble he had earlier? Well, I, I think it was reasonable to expect him to tire at some point because he had to work so hard to get back in the race, and then he's fighting his way through traffic, and he had a steady on several different occasions. I can forgive him bottoming out the last 16th of a mile, and I think the fact now that he's got to run, fitness-wise, it's going to propel him forward. And again, the mental aspect of this, that he saw so many situations in his first start. The next race will tell. If he's quality, he's supposed to come back, and if not win, be right there. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And obviously, you want to see how tough the field is. I'm concerned mm -hmm. this wasn't that strong a field. The JY, to me, was a horse off a layoff that got caught four wide, chasing around a slow pace the whole way, and I thought he was the most adversely affected from that perspective. I see what you're saying about the eight. Once again, I think this is a good example of don't just necessarily marry yourself. I mean, you know, make sure you're taking a look at the fields they're in, and both of them could be prices in their next starts, and at the very least, you want to use them. Whether or not they're going to be good enough, that's another story. Well, I, I think it's a fair assessment what you're saying. Maybe this was not the toughest race. That being said, I think these are two horses that have a forward movement in them. Is it good enough if it's a much tougher field? No, totally agree. A first-time starter in your case and the JY off a layoff for me. They're the two we want out of the race. We'll see where they go going forward. The last race we're going to talk about is the fifth race from Sunday the 20th. And we want to talk about a horse, Splendid Gold, who was just under 7-5 to five in this race and was the clear speed coming off a blowout win in a sprint race where she went fast fractions earlier. She was stretching out for the first time and the question is, how do you want to ride a stretch out speed type to maximize its chances? Well, you don't want to send them all out, obviously, because you're not going to be able to set the kind of fraction you did sprinting and be around at the end. But the balance is going fast enough where you're using your horse's natural gait, their weapon, their speed. She has one weapon. It's her speed. And allowing her to clear off and get away from horses because you can't hold her up and allow slower horses that have a finish to be in proximity to you and expect you're going to out-finish them. It's just not going to work. It's exactly how I felt about it. There's no sour grapes here. This was a short-priced horse that I picked on top, but I feel like the, the horse who won the race, I'd pick second, so it wasn't, and she had to paying a good price at $12. It's just a, it's a question we encounter, and it's not easy, because as you say, if the rider just lets her engine go and she goes 23 and 46, and she's in front by 10, she's going to tire. You've got to find some happy medium, and I think you want to allow the horse, Richie, to find a rhythm. Well, a absolutely, and I think the first quarter was okay because she almost looked a bit confused. The first turn kind of took her off guard a little bit, but the second fraction to me is the one that kept like everybody that. else in the race. When you go 24 and 1, 49 and 4 on a horse that's capable of going 45 and change, you have given away all your advantage. And I'm going to be fair about this. I don't think she's a horse that wants to go long under any I circumstance. I agree with you. Yeah. But that being said, you have no chance to win this way. Open up two or three. Go 48 instead of 49 and 4. And let everybody else kind of get dragged into the race with you. And at least then it's going to mitigate some of their kick. I agree. What you do is you use your speed to force the others to tire from chasing you. They're going to have to go faster than they want to go to keep up with you, and that will mitigate your closing kick. And that's one of the reasons we'll see, and we'll see around one turn race at Belmont, horses go 23 and 45 and 3 at a mile and a 16th, and they bottom the field out. And it happens is you may tire a little up front, but the ones that are chasing you are taking even more out of their game and tiring. And when I look at this race, and I think, and I'm not saying this to just sort of, you know, compliment at you, but I think of your ride on flashing when she won, I think it was still the gazelle. The gazelle, yeah. And it was here and it was in the fall. That was a situation where you knew how to open up just enough where you were going to put the field so they had to run to keep up with you, but you didn't go too fast to tire your horse out. No, and, and at some point, if you've gotten it somewhat soft on the, on the front end early, 
when do you use that advantage and don't give it back? And, and to me, that day, it was just about the three and a half furlong pole. I said, okay, the race is on now, boys. Now you got to try to run with me. And, and she was shifty enough where she could kind of bounce away and take everybody off the bridle. This filly, to me, you want her back sprinting. She just doesn't have the physical body type. That being said, I still, it, it still is frustrating for me to watch when you see a speed horse clear you know clear by the first turn and then they're pulled up back to the field just put your hands down and let them be happy i, I agree and i think the the ultimate case of that was bold forbes and the belmont stakes one of the greatest thinking man rides of all time and yeah. one of the things that's fun about the game is we think about it as handicappers and you try to intellectualize it and i think you do that as a rider as well Oh, oh, if you're doing your homework and you're paying attention, you certainly do. It's, it's not a merry-go-round. You know, you, you've got to, it, it, there's tactics involved, and you have to take advantage of your horse's strengths and other horses' weaknesses. And there has to be nothing more satisfying for you as a rider to do something, to imagine something in your head and make it work. Now, a lot of times you can imagine things in your head, and they don't work at all, and it all goes awry at the start. But when it works out, there has to be a great satisfaction in that. You know, there are a lot of horses that, as a rider, I won on that I had nothing to do with the victory. I might have even given them a bad ride, and they overcame me. But then there's those handful of rides that you felt like you really had a, you made a difference in how the race was run, and you dictated the terms of the race, and you helped your horse win. And I'm sure there's nothing more satisfying than that. Well, we got some help for today's show. We can always help use some help going forward. The email is tripsandtraps at nyrink.com.